welcome to the uh, third part of the um, strain silicon um, fundamental iterative innovation process. And last time we had uh, been through the uh, AT&T phase, but we hadn't quite talked about why it was necessary for innovation to leave that organization. So um, uh, what happened was that um, the ecosystem was changing, that uh, large corporations were now competitive. There was many. There was a lot of competition worldwide. Um, they didn't have their monopolistic forces in play, especially AT and T, which meant that which meant that direct profit for that company was trying to be maximized, and all the costs of R and D uh, were very high. And so clearly, you could um, have higher profit if if you cut back on R and D. But actually, strain silicon was one of the positive things because it showed how research could lead potentially to, to new things. So there was a period of time where I spent quite a bit of time trying to, with the manufacturing sites, um, in, in the language of our model, uh, try to, to start implementation or narrow, let's say, narrow implementation down um, within the implementation allowed at AT&T. And that meant going to AT&T's factories at Allentown or Reading. And that meant looking at the CVD growth uh, in Allentown. And this process went on for about a year and a year or two while we still kept on advancing the research. By, by now in the research space, we're very famous because this is, you know, considered a, uh, an incredible advance. But... Um, the it was becoming clear to me after a couple of years there was no way and again our, our model wasn't available then but in the context of our model uh, there was no way we were going to be able to have implementation space actually opened up wide enough to see how to get this kind of technology to marketplace because even though strain silicon was one of the applications it was known to be the one that had to be injected into the largest infrastructure because silicon technology was already taking off. And so the question is, would other applications be more appropriate first for the lattice mismatch technology, like optoelectronics? Should we be thinking about putting gallium arsenide in silicon and making optoelectronic integrated circuits? And if we're going to do that, you know, how do we manufacture them? So there is a lot of things that all of a sudden you started realizing, well, this isn't really going to happen here. It's too complicated. And so um, that and a few other factors made it very clear that uh, the future was not going to be there, and especially for this innovation. And so um, here we moved to MIT and um, uh, was able to get a lot of um, enthusiastic young people around a new idea. And there were still identified problems now, because even though we had the high mobility, there was things wrong with the material, like the defect density should still be lower. Uh, defects in different parts of the structure need to be controlled better. Uh, and significantly, the surface uh, was a little bit, um, had a uh, pattern on it that even though it really didn't affect mobility, it may affect manufacturing, and so there was this um, huge question of why does a surface respond like this when you have massive um, dislocation injection below but not up top, and, and uh, you know, what exactly is, is going on here? And so um, these are the issues we addressed when we came to MIT. Now, you can't just move your, all of your effort over to another organization all at once. And so that's why the barrier is quite high. And, and, you know, again, this is why normally you would leave the innovation behind and, um, and switch to um, a different topic or you stay at AT&T trying to pursue it even though, you know, it's not going to work there. So the barrier is quite high, but uh, we had lost time. But the good news is that the wave had already been started. Uh, Judy Hoyt, who is now at actually MIT with us, she was at Stanford at the time, and uh, she followed our work regarding the relaxation in silicon germanium. And they did a significant um, demonstration in that the strain silicon 
in a primitive MOSFET, you know, like a university MOSFET, showed um, uh, increased current drive, even though uh, it's a MOSFET. See, most of the devices that were being pursued had what were called buried channels, and that's because a lot of people had 3.5 Envy, because you can make buried channels in 3.5 devices, but uh, up till now, you couldn't make them in silicon. So with the advent of what we're doing, you could build very channel devices with great mobility and they, they were fantastic for for um, wireless devices you could see in the future possibly using them for wireless devices but um, this is really a jump towards um, saying that well they could even be used for all of digital electronics so there is a few barriers I mentioned the surface roughness and then now that we could do all this stuff um, it became clear that compressed germanium uh, in, in much the way like strained silicon, it's tensile strained silicon, and strained germanium, which would be compressed, uh, would advance whole carriers. Uh, see, electrons moved in tensile silicon very fast, but electrons and holes could move very fast in compressed germanium. And it turns out that um, compression and tension were the main things, and so we started to investigate that in research as well. Another significant thing is one of my first grad students who was um, very interested in doing something different um, was graduating. And so um, at the end of his PhD, we decided that uh, we would uh, try to form a small company. And also strain silicon by itself, not the compressed germanium, but the strain silicon was kind of at a point where, you know, we could be, I, I could be an academic where I just studied the same thing for 20 years at this point because it's so important. But um, you know, it seemed like that should move out out of the university and that we should be concentrating on things like compressed germanium and then later 3.5 integration instead of, um, you know, doing all of this strain silicon work uh, continuously into the future at, at MIT. So we did solve and get these fundamental things done. We um, were able to get a lot of good... Um, uh, IP, and then, like I said, we had to move on uh, get, and get practical embodiments uh, into, the, into the real world. One of the things we were able to do, by the way, which was the original goal back at Bell Labs, was now that we had improved germanium and silicon quite a bit over this period of time, we could deposit uh, gallium arsenide on top of that, that um, uh, germanium. So here's the, from here down is that technology that we had started at Bell Labs, but we hadn't gotten up to germanium with high quality, but M MIT we were able to. And then it turns out that with um, two element system on top of one element, this interface is actually quite tricky because the way that you put these elements down matters because there's choice of arsenic first, gallium first, and things like that, or mixed. And it turns out that if you don't do that just right, you can make horrible quality gallium arsenide, even though you have very little defect density here. But uh, by working on that interface and, and everything, we were able to show that, um, you know, 3.5 materials can now be integrated with silicon. Remember, silicon is below here because we have all the graded stuff up here. And so um, this, uh, this, this is a huge advance because we were able to show high quality 3.5, you know, material on silicon. In a way, it's very exciting, but it also created uncertainty because if you're going to jump out of the university, you now have several paths because it is such a fundamental advance. Uh, there are several products that, that you can imagine coming out of this. This is a photonics type of a product, but the strain silicon is an electronic one. And remember the buried channel device I was just talking about would be a wireless device. Each one of these has a separate application area and a separate area of the marketplace. So to now look at how this thing's narrowing as we move forward, uh, we now have uh, in the technology space, the key remaining problems are becoming quite defined. The threading dislocation density you need, the surface planarity for manufacturing, which is still related to physics of what's going on in here, and then process stability, which is still related to strain and equilibrium and dislocations and all that stuff. So, so the, so the Technology space is now getting quite focused, and uh, we've reduced a lot of the uncertainty into other areas. And as I mentioned, uh, you could have digital electronics, which is the um, strain silicon MOSFET, but there was the wireless 
um, strain silicon device, and then there was the integrated optoelectronics with the gallium arsenide on, on, on silicon. So it was not clear which application would, you know, be uh, the best one to, to go forward at this time. Then, very interestingly, um, now that we're out of AT&T, you can actually do the necessary steps you need to iterate with implementation. And as soon as you do, it became clear that, well, how do you do this? Because even if we have these things, do you make a new semiconductor company? What about the supply chain? Um, what does that look like? And how do we have this thing made? Do we really have to create our own plants? Or is it possible to use, you know, outsourced infrastructure? And what about intellectual property? Because at the end of the day, um, if you're a small enterprise and you're just kind of uh, doing this thing, all other companies that do this kind of advanced semiconductor commercialization are large companies. And so um, how does that work? So implementation starts to get narrowed finally, even though um, we're at a university, but we, you know, you're starting to get closer to forming a little company. And now it's clear that it is time to, to do so. And that those are things that you could not do with an AT&T because these options were not thought of inside a large corporation. So we did form Amberwave in 1998. And literally it was just incubated at MIT. Manx desk was there. And uh, uh, really we just moved wafers around and, and started to do, to do work, but it, it took a long time. And we had a phone in my house back then. There wasn't any of these nice internet phone systems or anything. So we had a simple recording machine at my house uh, for the company. Uh, so what we had was this ability to, to create these novel materials all on silicon. So the future was bright in that sense. Uh, there was these three markets. And I won't go into the details that I've listed here, but we found generally a partner in each area. And at this time, we hadn't found one yet, but later it would be uh, AMD. We felt that with a partner in each area, we could see who would support us the best, and it might help us determine how to go in, in a way that's like uh, related not only to market application space, but implementation, because you can see also, you know, which you know, how we would fit into a particular business model in each area. Uh, the funding at the beginning was done with SBIRs. In fact, the funding, interestingly enough, was in this middle area to start off the company. Um, and then later in this area, uh, Motorola. So Motorola was an early one, actually, but later it became AMD. But, but Motorola was very interested in digital electronics. And then you have, we have this problem of, you know, what about Amberwave? What kind of uh, business model is going to be? And we need to go further before we could determine uh, what, what business model it would actually have. So um, now, that, now that we were a separate entity, you know, the way to think about this is that the iteration process can continue a little bit more easily. Because if you're at MIT, you know, there's various um, problems. I mean, one, there's a conflict of interest, which meant that you're naturally prevented from doing certain things. Uh, you can only build a certain amount of prototypes uh, on campus. So, you know, we really have to start using outside resources. Um, what is the typical model uh, is that you take intellectual property with you by doing exclusive license. That's a typical university model, MIT model. And then, you know, this is actually key because you need kind of, you can't afford many, so you've got to kind of uh, have part-time, um, you need part-time folks, a large number of them actually, and then also try to concentrate your resource on a few people with special characteristics that can deal with uncertainty. There was Mank, my first graduate student, and then Rich Hammond, who was a graduate student from a group, a similar group to ours in the United Kingdom. And so we were able to get young people that were able to deal with this, but knew the technology area very well. So let me stop there, because in the next section, I'd like to talk about the uh, supply chain, because one of the big things is now that you're actually going out there, now that you have a small company, now that you're iterating, implementation, remember, was a thing that was being held up, being an AT&T, but now things are really starting to iterate. It kind of becomes much clearer, and I want to talk a little bit about supply chain and then and then how we kind of gradually understood from this perspective how we would
possibly work with the semiconductor industry. So we'll stop there. Mm -hmm.